Yeah, I, I, my father uh, played drums uh, when he was in the army. Uh, I never saw him play in a band or anything like that, but, but he was a, a musician, a drummer in the army, and he brought that love of jazz and, and into the house, into my sphere of awareness, you know? So I would, you know, I would be woken with a really loud record of a big band, Terry Gibbs or Count Basie, big bands just playing, you know, on the weekend, and he'd just come in laughing, and, and I loved it. I loved it. It was beautiful, amazing stuff. This was at a Jamie Abersall camp, right? So Jamie Abersall is a uh, educator, uh, and he'd have these these uh, jazz camps. And this was in San Jose, California, and I lived in Santa Cruz, California. Larry lived close to San Francisco. I actually, since I was a little bit older, um, I wasn't really in the camp or anything. But I got um, word they were asking if I could come to play because they didn't have a drummer that was good enough to play in the, the A band or whatever. And so Larry and his brother Steve, the guitarist, was in the band. And, and that's when we first met. And uh, it was fun, you know. I mean, we just played frisbee, um, you know, all the time, hanging out. And, and, uh, and then I started playing with him uh, and another couple other younger guys in, in, in the area. And there was a, a really great moment for me with Larry. Um, I mean, I've been playing with him for more than 30 years, you know, so this is a long time ago. So uh, we were playing very early, uh, a song with Bill Evans, very early. And um, it was during the bass solo. And I'd been playing a little bit with school big bands, and, and I've been playing a lot with Afro-Cuban bands, too, and wedding bands. And, and here we are playing very early, some you know, jazz, more modern sense. And I'm in the middle of this bass solo, and I'm not sure, you know, if we're all in the same place. And I mean, it was very, you know, modern and, and surprising and dangerous sounding. And it's like, God, you know, are we gonna make it? And and I guess the the biggest sense was of trust. You know, it's like you gotta trust this guy. He knows where he is, and you trust. You know where you are. And we came out at the end, and it was just. Amazing feeling, you know. Never had that kind of a journey through a you know, of exploration, you know, through a song before that. So, I mean, he's a few years younger than me, but he's always been the, you know, kind of a a wise man and a wise young man, and and uh, I learned a lot through him. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's. Maybe a huge difference between our generation and, and this generation now, and, and maybe a, a, a little older, also, uh, generation between us, maybe. Um, and that's how this information is, is being relayed, you know? So I was very fortunate. Uh, there was a, a pianist uh, in my hometown who was great, great. His name was Smith Dobson, played great piano, and he knew all kinds of music from all kinds of eras and would sing and we do all kinds of stuff. And he had a regular job in, in a town over, over the hill, a ways away. And so on Tuesdays I would ride with him and I was like 16 and he'd take me over and, and uh, I'd sit in for the night and we'd play standards or Donny Hathaway tunes or Stevie Wonder or what uh, a, a, a huge repertoire, you know. And, uh, and that was huge for me. That was a big, big, uh, not just the playing, but also the ride to and from the gig. And we'd listen to Miles for and more and, you know, by osmosis, you know, he's, you know, you're listening, you hear more because this other one's hearing that, you know, in some sense it's transferred. So that was a huge one. And then there was some uh, guys that I played with, with Larry that were also a bit older and, and, um, and, and more experienced, gave me that experience. Um, a couple, of, one great uh, pianist, Buddy Montgomery, was huge for me. That was a little bit later. Yeah, so uh, Smith was a huge one for me up until I started. I moved up to San Francisco and I started playing with guys of my age and kind of what we like to play, a little more wild or experimental or. And then I, I went on the road with uh, Ray Charles, like 
um, in 88, 1988. And, uh, and that was huge. That was a school like no other. Amazing. <laughs> For me, the first guy that really kind of got me um, through one specific thing he did on his symbol was uh, uh, Joe Morello. And that was like early, early on before I was really even, you know, I was pretending to play, you know. And um, it was this song called Far, Far More Drums. And there was a moment when he hits his bass drum and he hits the symbol and he crashed the symbol. And then he kind of chased the, the symbol up to the crown and choked it, so he kind of made this bending thing with the sound, and that just caught me. That, that's, that, I remember that very clearly. So that was a, a Joe thing, and then his soloing was, was amazing. Um, and Mel Lewis was huge for me, because the big band. Sonny Payne was, I was Sonny Payne, you know. I played at Basie morning, day, and night, you know, Basie. So Sonny Payne was my guy, really for a super, super long time. And then uh, after that, it was I started kind of getting into uh, more modern guys and kind of skipped over to Steve Gadd for a bit because uh, Chick's uh, Three Quartets record came out. And um, yeah, and then, and then something happened. Uh, there was a director in the junior college I was going to. I was going to high school and, uh, and playing in a, a junior community college band. And he was very good. His name was Ray Brown, a uh, trumpet player. And he was saying, you know, you got to change up your ride a little bit. You know, you can't just play the same way all the time or just ding, ding, my, you know. And, uh, and so he gave me a, a collection of records, you know, and, and in there was, was Tony, you know, was uh, you know, my funny Valentine, Four and More, and, and then some, uh, some Steve Gadd with Chick uh, called Friends. Um, so Mickey Roker he turned me on to, too, which is not so modern like, like those guys, but kind of opened it up to another way of, of playing. Great feel. So another mentor and another way of saying, check this out and, and play with. Uh, playing with records all the time was, was the closest I could get until I started playing with someone like Ray or like Chick or, or you know. Luke Donaldson was another one I got to play with one, later on, you know, after Ray. I mean, I can't, one thing I would like to have said is, is you know, playing with people who, who have been part of the, the invention of this stuff is invaluable. You know, I, I feel incredibly lucky that, incredibly lucky that I, I've had that experience because it's, 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 made, it's given me this firsthand appreciation, experience and awareness of what it takes to, to make it happen, you know? And it, it wasn't through a, it wasn't through a book, you know. It wasn't through a, you know, a, a checklist of I do this, I do this, I do this, and I'm right and I'm cool and I, I play right, you know. Not at all. So that's a huge difference, and, and that's kind of a, an issue, that I am trying to address as I as I teach. <laughs> It's extremely hard because here we are in, a, in, a, in a, a completely different environment. I can't say artificial environment, but compared to a performance environment, it's, it's nothing at all like that, you know? There's no danger here. There's no, you know, desperation of, I got to keep this gig, you know? I hope I get the gig. I hope I can keep the gig. It, it, no, you know, it's, oh, it sounds fine. You know, come back next week. We'll work on it some more, you know? Very safe. So a part of that, that, that kind of comfort uh, does something to how people are playing. You know? A big question I, I get, or a question I get often, is, you know, um, kind of like, what is it, I'll boil it down to say, what does it take to be successful? And I never thought about that, you know. My answer is, can you play, <laughs> you know? So where's, where's the head, you know, what are we doing? You know, I needed to play because I just, I had to, I had to, you know, I wanted to play with these great players. And I'm not saying that that's not there, you know, people, kids want to, you know, students want that as well. But there's this added thing of, you know, a job, is it your, you know, your job. I've had questions like, how do you get a record deal? 
You know, how do you, how, you know, how do you get work in New York? You know, do you go out and sit in and say, you know what, there's no, you can't just worry about playing what you can play, like play as best as you can, you know, that kind of thing. What I'm seeing is there's, there's this lack of um, opportunity to, to learn through osmosis, as you say, you know, or, or have the experience, right? So what's the next best thing? Play a record, play to a record, you know? You're playing with, as close as you're gonna get to playing with those guys, you know? So, okay, go play to a record. But now I'm saying, but you don't know what you're doing. And you're not gonna just play exactly what that person's playing, because that's not what's done either. Not only that, you do learn what the masters have done and you, you try to assimilate their, their spirit or their sensibilities so you can kind of make sense through their eyes. You do that, for sure. But um, I'm kind of making uh, an exercise out of playing to a few specific tracks that I'm, I've picked that are um, kind of bare bones, nuts and bolts, uh, meat and potato kind of information, kind of way of playing, which really addresses how it feels when we're playing. There's so, there's an, everybody's got, almost everybody I'm teaching has enough ability to last a f quite a while. So it's not a question of ability. It's a question of, of experience and knowing what, what you're doing, basically, you know. I often make a joke about, you, just, you know, it's like, what you're, you're, you're doing this, you're doing this thing. It's a tool, you know, you can do that. It causes excitement, you know. It's a, it's a, but it's like a tool, like a chainsaw, you know. If you don't know what you're doing, you're gonna ch chop off your leg, you know, or somebody else's, you know. Be careful with this stuff, it's dangerous, you know. Trying to make it serious, trying to make it, not make it, trying to make their realization, you know, of the seriousness of, you know, of what this is, you know. So uh, the restriction I give for an exercise of playing with a record is I'll say, okay, with this thing, I need you to play so soft, only quarter notes in this case, and we're playing tempo of a, a swing time and there's walk and bass. I need you to be able to hear the bass line. I need you to hear the bass line. I need you to be able to hear everything. So you're like a guy in the car that's in the back seat for the ride. You do not have a steering wheel. You cannot do anything. When you feel the, the, the initial, like the inspiration to do something, that's fantastic. It should come, you know? But you cannot do something. Do not do a thing. What you, what you do do is you listen to see what they do with that impulse that you just felt. So in that way, I'm hoping that they're gonna get their vocabulary, but they're gonna get it in context. Basically, I've kind of arrived at the realization that you can't really, I can't tell anybody how to play. So basically, they need to build their own intimate or their own personal relationship with how to play, what it means to them. So, you know, at the upbeat means something to me. The downbeat means something to me. What does it mean to you, man? You know, and what about the end of three? What does that mean to you, you know? What does a downbeat in the middle of a chorus mean to you? What does a downbeat at the beginning of a chorus? Or the top of the bridge, or the upbeat on the, after the downbeat of the, I mean, all of these kinds of um, um, many relationships that you have inside this music and the reasons of why you're doing what you're doing or why they're doing what the masters have done, what they've done, you're also selecting and discarding and building your, your understanding. It's not like, you know, there are codes, there are certain licks, there are certain things that are definitely like old things. Know that stuff, you know? But that's not like, okay, I got it, I can do that, so I'm cool, I can play, you know? It's not, it's just that would be very superficial. What does that mean to you? Do you need that kind of a, that kind of a lick to do the thing that you need it to do? So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of realizing that now, the more I'm doing this, you know. I can see everybody's looking for that, like that golden key or the golden phrase or the perfect checklist, you know, to make it all kind of make sense so they can do it. Man, you gotta do it yourself. You have to do it yourself. So I can't tell you how to play. 
I can tell you you're dragging. I can tell you, you know, you're, you're not sitting well. I can tell you, you know, the sound is like this and that's because of this. And I can get into detail, but how to play, don't look to me for that, you know. I tried that last year, like playing along, trying to help them with time with real playing, and, but it's out of context still, you know. So playing with records, I think, is a, is a very, very helpful thing. And I'm hoping it will, uh, it will, uh, it will, it will work. I think so. You know, no. I, I gotta say, you know, it's, it, it's easier when you play with great people, you know? It's like you, it, it's, you're being shown how it works, you know? So if, if I'm nervous, is I'm not ready, right? So, you know, I'm full of my oats, I'm full of my whatever. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm down, I'm, I, can, I can play with this guy or I can play with that guy. Yeah, call me up, you know? There's a moment when um, there's a uh, jazz festival in Japan and, and at the end of it, we're all playing on the stage and it's Herbie's like kind of the master of ceremonies. And, and there was a moment when I'm up there playing and he looked right at me and was, that was a little like, oh crap, you know? But man, it's a chance to, to play. I'm not ashamed of, of stuff I play, you know? I'm not afraid of, of um, being wrong in a way, you know? Because it's, it's, it's kind of makes sense. It's, it's, it's obvious what's happening in a way, you know? Before, maybe uh, if I'm playing with someone and, and maybe uh, um, I lose track of, of keeping good time and it drags and they get angry and they'll, man, you know, and I messed up, you know? But it wasn't about um, being nervous or, or anything like that. It was just uh, it was more of a spanking for, for not being correct, you know? But if there's a chance to play, you know, like I just, I would give my, you know, right leg to play with Wayne. I mean, after the gig. First I gotta play the gig. You know, I would love to play with these amazing guys. I could agree with that, absolutely, you know. But also in a more selfish sense, it's kind of um, getting to feel that feeling of what whatever that is. It's playing together. I mean, it's bigger when you play together than when I play alone. I mean, I get to that, that state mo sometimes, but playing with other people, it's, man, it's, uh, it's immediate you get to that state of kind of total immersion, you know, you're, you're, you're in, and there's just this, it's like jumping underwater, and there's all this stuff is like glowing and shining and mystery and, and brilliance and, and you definitely share, and I talked earlier about trust, you know, and that feeling of camaraderie. It's, you, you know, you guys are in this, making this, you know, I, I just, I mean, playing with Mark and Larry, I love them, you know, so much through the music and, and as beings too, you know. And the same with Brad and Larry. It's just astounding, you know. I never get to that frame of mind, that type of a head without the help of my friends. <laughs> I think playing with records is, is one of the best ways to, to get a sense of what's going on. It took me a, a while to really, you know, understand that, I mean, hearing myself back on a recording or something, I felt like I was kind of behind the beat, you know, kind of, kind of logy a little bit, you know? And I couldn't figure out how to get out of that, you know, other than make, like push it and kind of, and that just doesn't feel good either, you know? So it, it, it was, it's, it's a little mystery, you know, but playing with records, kind of with this awareness of, of um, maybe touch is a, is, a, is a very helpful thing, you know. Um, one bass player took me aside one day and he said, come on, we're gonna work on time. I said, okay, you know. So he sets the metronome at something really fast. Click, 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 click. So he says, okay, ready? Go. Stop. And you listen to the metronome. You know, what happened? You know. And uh, it was sometimes cool, sometimes not. So inconsistent, right? So he was saying he thinks of some uptime, like up tempo stuff, 
as, as like just right there, you know, just right here. So you're kind of looking up to that. So there's something that you're going to, you know? That was cool, that worked for a while, you know? But then you talk about a ballad, you know? What do you do with a ballad? Where is this thing now, you know, is it there? Kind of bizarre, no? So, playing with Ray Charles, playing a ballad, is you have to be able to swing a ballad with that guy, you know? And so the drummer that played before me, we were talking, he says, man, don't worry, man, you just play triplets, you'll be okay, you know? And in a way, that's right, you know? Ding, ding, bang, ding, you know? Ding, ding, ding. But it's not like that either, man, you know? Because when Ray swings, it's not ding, ting, 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 ting. It's not that, you know? Ting, 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 ting. It's all over, you know? But it's very steady and cool. So what is it? Well, you have to just know the space that you're in, I think, you know? So maybe it's a spatial awareness. Then uh, let's say that maybe uh, if you only leave it at spatial awareness, it's kind of from the neck up kind of a type of way. So what we're missing is 80% of the rest of your body, you know? You know, when I was, even through Ray, with playing with Chick, um, my time, my placement, my marking time was with my, all of my everything was going through the tip of the stick of my right side. Just that. So imagine you're squeezing everything through something this big. <laughs> what an idiot, you know? That's not gonna work. And so time was like this metronomic dot, you know? Dock, dock, you know? And how hard is that? I mean, it's, I'm setting myself up for, for you know, the worst time ever, you know? No pun intended. Um, so I, I came across something, you know, uh, later on about maybe, let's say, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 years ago, um, which was, you know, just getting a good strike, you know? I was, I was listening to um, some music, some, some Stevie Wonder, and I'm tapping on the door of the car, you know, I wish, it was great, you know? And I'd look at my hand, and it looked so corny. It, there was no depth at all, no depth at all. So I, I, man, it doesn't look good at all. It, it definitely isn't feeling good. So of course, you know, you start hitting harder to make it more deep, you know, more solid. And, and that was a little more, but it was, I still felt some sort of resistance of some sort. It wasn't, it wasn't happening. It wasn't like I saw Elvin, you know, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like when I saw Art Blakey. It wasn't like when I saw this great drummer, Eddie Marshall, Donald Bailey. It wasn't like Billy, Billy Hart. These are guys like my guys, you know? Um, it wasn't like, I, I remember seeing um, Brian Blade. He did something, went around and goes kaboom, you know? It's like, man, that's what I'm talking about. A beautiful friend of mine, uh, Jimmy Green, he's clapping to a tune. Man, that's it right there, you know? What the heck, you know? And, and I had been playing, you know, for a long time, 20 years or something. And uh, I saw this Tony Williams video and he was talking about, you know, he says, what's the hardest thing about playing? Or what's the first thing you do before you hit the drum? Or what's the hardest thing about playing? And uh, he says, picking up the stick. Letting it fall down is a ride. And it kind of went ding. I said, oh, let my hand fall, let my arm fall down. You know, so it, it, I spent about two years trying to throw up my arm and letting it fall down. And then the same with the legs. Really hard when you've been, for the last 20 years, controlling where you were gonna put the beat, you know? So letting it fall down and then holding a stick and letting it fall down and smacking it. And then holding a stick, lifting it up, let it fall down and sound good, you know, in the drum, not just like going, right? So forever, I'm like one, 
two. So like metronome at, at 10, you know, or 15 or something. So it's all about, am I sitting correct? Is this, okay, now this is being picked up. This is being picked up. What am I doing with this leg? How much, am I putting pressure? Am I good? It has to be that slow. It's like lifting weights. I use the analogy a lot, you know? You don't use, with weightlifting, you don't lift 10, 10, 10, 50. Cool, I did 50, you know? No, you're doing one that busts down all the muscles and, you know, so they can build back up, right? Same thing, it's like I'm imprinting on my body kind of the, the experience of what it feels like to let my arm fall down. Um, and the benefits of this one exercise was incredible. I, I didn't know what I, was, what I had tapped into, you know, but the sound changed, my articulation changed, my, 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 uh, my energy was better because I was better distributed, you know, and, and time got better. My time was coming from my whole body in a way, not just the tip of my stick. You know, I gotta say, I just remembered or realized before this, I had played a, a, a tour with Lou Donaldson and I was playing the way I was playing before. And I wasn't, I never played like four quarter notes on the bass drum because that just, I didn't hear that. Even though I'm playing with all this big band stuff before, I never heard it, you know, or just didn't do it because it didn't feel good or something. Um, and he asked me to do that on the gig and it just was horrible. I sucked, you know, it was terrible. So we finished, you know, and, but every time I wasn't playing, he'd turn around and look at me, like, you know, look at the bass drum, look, you know, okay, blah, 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 right? So when I got home, I started really just doing that really loud, like the faucet wide open, blah, 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 blah. And that's when I first got a sense of like, oh man, it's, it's coming from various spots. It's not just this thing. It's, it's like, it's, my time was more of like this straight horizon on the ocean kind of, okay, she can sit and sit like that instead of like, there's the, there's the way it, it's cut up, you know? And then the next evolution of all of that was, was this sense of letting my, including my physical, my, my body in the sense of playing as well. And that really just gave me a huge seat. So I had a much better place from where I was playing. I'm extremely lucky, you know, I'm, I feel super lucky to play with them. They're the highest caliber musicians around, you know. Um, the biggest mind, the biggest ears, you know, uh, the amazing touch. You know, Brad can, can calibrate a room of 2,500 people with one note, you know. And, and Larry is, is, like I said, he's an old soul, you know. He's an old guy in there, you know. And uh, that wisdom and, and taste is, is uh, uh, you know, it's incredible. It's very brilliant. Both of them are incredibly brilliant on quite a few levels, you know. So and musically, um, I've never played in a band that was so uh, closely dealing with every element that's being played, you know. Everything I do is being used by Brad or Larry. Everything that they're doing, I'm trying to use. One thing I really value about uh, playing with Brad is um, he doesn't verbally do this, but he insists that you do not sit back on your chair. You do not play flat-footed. You always are, are seeing what it can do. You never set into a specific thing. Unless it's very specific, say, I need this static thing or something, you know? He, he'll musically not allow for it. If he feels like, you know, like if I, it doesn't happen anymore, but if at the beginning there, I was kind of, okay, I'm gonna sit in this groove, you know? And then all of a sudden he stopped playing, you know? It's like, oh man, you're asking for something. And so I'd play and he, he's looking for food like that, you know? And, and Larry's just incredible, man. I mean, he can, uh, I don't know, he's just builds, he builds, he's, he builds huge things, you know? He's, he's just incredible, man. Um, never, never kinda 
will never ruin something. Like I'll, I'll, I'll maybe make something ugly in a way by taking a chance. And he just, it's not built into him to, to do that. You know, he won't, he won't wreck anything, you know. He's always, I can always depend on, on like a good, good choice from that guy, you know. What came from my, my uh, practice of this uh, drop, letting the arm drop, and was an awareness of pressure. And so I, I started thinking of volume in terms of size and not level. So I have a size of sound. So I occupy, occupy a certain amount of s space. So that keeps me at a correct size dimension for the room as well, you know? As long as I can hear them, I'm cool, you know? Um, I also won't play very densely if it's a very, you know, uh, reverberant room for the same reason, you know? If it's more dense, it's, it's, it's a, it occupies more volume of space, you know? So I play accordingly. Um, I may mute my drums as I play more often than not, than, than if it's a different room. I may change the tuning of the drums to make sure that, you know, some tones aren't really getting in the way of anybody. I'm not so married to it has to be like this and it's, no, I can change it up. And, and so little bits, little um, tuning changes, how much you play, like if it's a very fast tune, I'm not really gonna get really all swimmy in there because it'll just get ridiculous. So I'll play more straight quarter notes and bigger steps, you know, in a way. Yeah, I, I think I'm trying to hear everything, you know. It's not, I'm not directing it to anything in specific unless it's a necessity, you know. Maybe the bass needs to be, I need to have this hook up better because the rest of the band is far away or it could be some logistic problem or something like that. But no, man, it's you, you hear everything that's going on or that's not going on, you know? You hear silence, you hear the sound and you hear the mix of the sound, you know, is, you just, I, I try to hear as much as I can. There's no, um, there's no, um, we say, editing or, 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 you know, selective, it's not selective listening. It's everything I can grab. And, and in myself as well, in, in like a third person I'm hearing myself, you know. That's very helpful. Follow your heart and play what you feel, you know, is, is most important to you. And you know when you're jiving yourself. You know when you're just, you know, you're kind of bullshitting. So don't do that. You know, it's hard. It's super hard. Man, it's no joke. It's not a game. This is serious stuff. You know, and you want to play? There's a lot of great people out there that can play. So you want to play? Come on. Man, there's room. I always say there's room for everybody, you know, because, you know, um, we reinvent the instrument when we, f when we find the way we want, want the thing to be played. That's why I'm playing, you know, because I need to hear the drums played this way, and I love it, you know. Um, so there's room for everybody, you know. Don't worry about, you know, getting the gig, you know. Get good enough to get the gig, you know. But like I say, you know, if you follow your, 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 your love of, of what it is, respectfully, you know, humbly, you know, diligently dig in there and figure out what makes it work. Where did that come from? What was that come, where did that come from? Wow, how did that come from over there, you know? What's that like? Don't just, you know, don't treat it, you know, uh, lightly. It's a very, very uh, heavy thing that we're talking about here. It's great. We're lucky to, that, it, that we've invented it, you know? Human beings, right? Yeah. Kind of nuts. <laughs>